Well, hello and welcome back to uh, Dynamics Engineering uh, 212. And I wanted to pick up where we left off last time and uh, talk about planetary gear sets. You'll find these in a lot of different applications. Uh, automatic transmissions use uh, quite a few of them. Industrial equipment for final drives and things like that. And we'll talk more about uh, that as we uh, wrap up this section. You can even find them in a pencil sharpener. If you take, uh, take an older manual pencil sharpener and take the uh, dust cup off of it, you'll actually see a, a planetary arrangement. So uh, they're, they're around and they have uh, advantages that you can get uh, different ratios out of them. So uh, the, the way the uh, planetary works is you're going to have a uh, sun gear located in the, uh, the middle and then you would have a planet gear uh, rotating around that and then you would have a uh, ring gear. It's always a push to see if I can draw that. And uh, you, you could actually have an arrangement uh, like this that would be very unbalanced. It would have tremendous uh, uh, side loading on it. So usually at, at the minimum you'll see two planet gears and uh, sometimes you'll see three or four. Maybe we will put uh, some more planet gears here like this. And then the planet gears are actually hooked together with what's known as a uh, carrier. So you have three things then. You have the planet gear and the carrier, uh, that being one. You have the sun gear, that being the uh, second. And finally, you have the outside ring gear, that being the third. And this ring gear, I haven't drawn it, uh, but it has the, the teeth in here, and then the teeth on the uh, planet gears and, uh, engage that, and then the uh, teeth on the uh, sun gear engage the teeth on the planet gear. So let's uh, look at a situation here. Let's uh, say that we have a uh, sun gear like this and then I'll put a uh, planet gear down here and a planet gear up here and a planet gear there like that not great but it could be worse so and we'll take these uh, three planet gears and hook those together with a uh, carrier or a standard arrangement there. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the output on the carrier. So output on the uh, carrier. We're going to put uh, the input on the sun. And we're going to fix then the ring gear. Okay, and this is uh, what how this normally works. Usually, you're going to be inputting on one, outputting on the other, and you will fix the uh, the third one. <clears throat> and it could there's nothing that says it always has to input on the sun. You could input on the ring gear, or you could input on the uh, the carrier. And we'll talk about how that will uh, change things. Well, with that, let's go ahead and look at that uh, sun gear. So if I draw a diagram of the uh, sun gear, and I look at uh, what we have going on here, the uh, sun gear is going to be rotating, we'll say it's uh, rotating counterclockwise, and we'll say that that's omega n. So with the center of the sun gear here, um, if we have some radius of the sun gear, I could say that this is r sub s, the radius of the sun gear, I would know that I have some velocity here um, <coughs> that's going to be equal to omega n times the radius of the sun gear, right? And if we look at the um, relationship of that uh, sun gear here, where it hooks into the uh, planet gear, if I if I look at uh, that, I know then that if that uh, planet gear is uh, meshed with that, if the teeth are engaged, if the teeth are not to be stripped off, it has to have the same velocity. So let me look at a little larger picture of this. Let me come down here and look at uh, this picture and say that I have this planet gear Again, not too round but not too bad and if this ring is fixed I know that this is effectively uh, rotating about this point I have a point of no slip if you will I mean I could draw it like that or if you wanted to be really severe about it you could say that you had a, a pivot point there no slip 
Eventually we're going to call that the instantaneous center of zero velocity, or, or maybe we, we already have. Um, but if I look then up here, we, we agreed that we would have the same velocity as the sun gear because these gears are meshed together. So this is going to have a velocity here of omega n times r sub s. And then by ratio and proportion, where this would be the uh, radius of the planet gear, I could look at the velocity here as omega n times the radius of the sun divided by 2. That's our similar triangles, and we could uh, come up with that. So now, if I look at this point, which is right here, that's attached to the carrier. So if I draw this carrier like this, it's going to have some omega out, if you will. And this velocity here, because I've got this uh, carrier attached at this point, this point right there, we know that this is what? Omega n times the radius of the sun divided by 2. Well, if I look at the center of this uh, carrier, that distance there would be what? It's going to be the radius of the sun gear plus the radius of the planet gear, right? The distance to the center of this thing is the radius of the, the planet gear plus the radius of the sun gear. So I'd have that distance. So I could say then, if I wanted to look at this omega out, that omega out, so omega out, and remember that uh, omega um, is going to be just the velocity. Do we have a velocity here? Yeah, right here. Omega n times the radius of the sun divided by 2. I have to, to get omega, in general, omega is equal to the velocity divided by some radius. So what's the radius here? Well, that's the radius of the sun plus the radius of the planet, right? So if I rearrange this, um, I could say that uh, omega out over omega in is equal to the radius of the sun divided by 2 times the radius of the sun plus the radius of the uh, planet. And I could further rearrange this if I wanted to. Give myself a little more space there. I could, If I wanted to talk about omega in over omega out, I could say that omega in over omega out is equal to, I'd flip that, so I'm going to have 2 radius of the sun plus the radius of the planet divided by the radius of the sun. Let's see if I break up this. So this denominator goes with this term and goes with that term. I'd have 2 times the radius of the sun over the radius of the sun, which is going to be equal to 2, plus then 2 times the radius of the planet over the radius of the sun. 2 times the radius of the planet over the radius of the sun. And that's probably a, a, a good place to leave that. Okay. One thing that we will also note that our input was counterclockwise. This is uh, counterclockwise and our output is also counterclockwise. So it's going in the same direction. We'll change this up and see that that's not always the case. But before we do that, let's say that you looked uh, this up in a uh, manual. So we'd say from a handbook. And lots of different, you could look at engineering handbooks or automotive handbooks or something like that. Um, <clears throat> fairly common uh, for them to talk about the input over the output. And uh, so we've got input over out. I didn't do a very good U there. Input over out is equal to 1 plus the radius of the ring gear divided by the radius of the sun. Lots of different cases, but if we sort out our particular case, which was outputting on the carrier, having the ring fixed, and having the input on the sun gear, you look up in the handbook and you find something like that. And you think that, hmm, wait a minute. We don't uh, have those same values. Well, 
Well, let's see if we can uh, justify this. I could say that this was equal to 1 plus, what's the radius of the ring gear? If I come back and I look at the radius of the ring gear, that's going to be from there to there, which is the radius of the sun, plus the radius of the planet, plus another radius of the planet. So I have two times the radius of the planet plus the sun gear. So let me do that. The radius of the ring gear is the radius of the sun plus two times the radius of the planet. And then I need to divide, divide by the radius of the sun. So I could say that this is equal to 1 plus, what's the radius of the sun over the radius of the sun? That's also 1, isn't it? Plus 2 times the radius of the planet over the radius of the sun, which would be equal to 2 plus 2 times the radius of the planet over the radius of the sun. Have we seen this before? Yeah, absolutely right there. A little different subscript, uh, but exactly the same thing. So we can be... Uh, pretty happy with that. Well, it's always good to, uh, to look at uh, some, something else and while they use may use different symbols and different nomenclature uh, you should always come up with the, the same results. So I think we can have some, some confidence in our work here based on the instantaneous, uh, uh, instantaneous center of zero velocity the uh, point of, of no slip. And that really is what breaks these problems apart. A lot of times people make these way more complicated than they are and all you have to do is draw these simple diagrams and go through them. Let's try one more case. So we can take essentially this same gear train and mix it up a little bit differently. So well, let's say if I take the, uh, the same thing again um, and say that I have, there's a planet, there's a sun, another planet here, a planet there. Let's see if we can draw this. Okay, not too bad. Could be worse. Put our carrier here connecting the planets together. And a lot of times you may have a three or six. If you take a, a lot of automatic transmissions, uh, they sell kits to make them stronger. And a lot, one of the pieces among many is they'll have uh, planetary sets that have more planet gears in them. Uh, but anyway, we'll take this example here. And we're going to say that the carrier is fixed. We're going to say that we're inputting on the sun. And that means that we would output on the ring. Okay, how's that compare to the first one that we started with? We were outputting on the carrier and the ring was fixed. So we've mixed those up a little bit. It'll be interesting to see what happens. So with um, this, we've got this uh, carrier is fixed. So maybe I'll look at uh, what's going on with this planet gear up here. Okay. Got kind of large so I can see it easily. If I've input on the uh, sun, we'll say that maybe it's rotating like that. So I could say that I have, um, I mean, it, it would probably, maybe I should reiterate that if we have the uh, sun gear here. So that's uh, omega n. This is the sun. The velocity up here is going to be omega n times the radius of the sun, right? And we know that if these are meshed together, if they're not stripping the teeth off of those gears, that they have to be going at the same velocity for them to uh, to be have their uh, the teeth meshed together. I just haven't drawn the teeth because no one wants to watch me put all these uh, little teeth on that thing. So with that, I know that these this point shares the same velocity. That is, this velocity is going to have to be the same as that velocity there. So omega n times the radius of the sun gear. And we know that this carrier is fixed. This is the uh, essentially the point of no slip, the instantaneous center of, of zero velocity. It's, it's fixed like that, isn't it? So 
with that, I know by ratio and proportion that <coughs> excuse me, the velocity up here has to be omega n times the radius of the sun. And it's actually negative uh, because it's going in the opposite direction. This one's going to the left, this one's going to the right, so we'll account for that with a negative sign. So with that, if I go up and look at the uh, ring then, so I take this up to the ring gear, I'm going to have this velocity here because this ring gear is meshed the, uh, the, the planet gear here is meshed into the ring gear. So I'm going to have this velocity here. The velocity here has to be the same as the output of the ring. So I could say that I have minus omega n times the radius of the sun. Now this is going to have then some omega out. And if we look at the distance to the center of this, what what distance is that? Should be the radius of the ring gear, right? So I can say then, therefore, that omega out is going to be equal to what? Minus omega in over the radius of the sun. minus omega n over the radius of the sun, divided by the radius of the ring gear. Maybe I'll be consistent and use this as a capital R here. Let me do that. So radius of the ring gear. That's a little better. So I could say then as I work through this that omega out over omega n is equal to minus the radius of the sun over the radius of the ring gear. I didn't want to do that. The radius of the ring gear. There we go. And if I flip that so I can get this a little more common to report omega in over omega out would be equal to the radius of the ring gear. Maybe I'll Type right out ring. We'd have the negative sign, and then I have the radius of the sun. Okay, so the radius of the ring gear divided by the radius of the sun gear. And remember that the radius of the uh, ring gear note that the radius of the ring gear is really equal to what? Well, be from the center there, which is the radius of the sun plus two times the radius of the planet. So it's equal to the radius of the sun plus two times the radius of the planet. So you can make that substitution if you wanted to. What I really like uh, would like to look at is this negative sign. We see that the input is going counterclockwise, uh, but the output is going clockwise. So we get this negative sign. They differ in direction. So we took the same arrangement that we had before, and by fixing uh, certain things differently, inputting on different things, outputting on different things, we got an entirely different ratio. And this is how your automatic transmission works. When you hear about the band slipping or something like that, that's uh, what's holding a, a certain thing fixed. And obviously, that's going to change your, your ratios. So you could take um, uh, one or sometimes two of these uh, planetary arrangements and then get multiple uh, gear arrangements from that. Another interesting thing that they uh, do with these is they use them um, in industrial settings um, or agricultural settings in final drives. So let's talk a little bit about that. Let's say that you have a uh, tractor that maybe looks like um, this. Uh, you can fast forward if you don't want to see me draw tractors here. Good. Okay, if you had a tractor that looks like this, or maybe even a larger articulated uh, tractor. You've seen those large articulated tractors. The uh, Whether we're looking at the final drives and the uh, driven axle in the back here, assuming it's two-wheel drive, or whether we're looking at the uh, final drives for, for both of those axles, what those are probably going to look like, 
Uh, sometimes if you get into industrial equipment, you'll see a great big uh, hub in the center, and that's actually a final drive, and it's a planetary right at the center. Usually in agricultural tractors like this, they don't necessarily have that because they want to be able to have an axle where the uh, wheel will slide in and out on the axle so they can adjust the tractor width for uh, different types of uh, farming operations. So usually these are more inboard. They're inside the, the, the transmission and the rear axle and things like that. But usually what they have is they have a planetary arrangement like this. And I'm going to keep this real simple and just say that they have a couple planet gears. They probably have more than that because they want a lot of strength in there. Uh, but they'll have an arrangement like this where they have then the uh, ring gear is usually going to be fixed. And fix the ring gear. We're going to input on the sun. On the uh, sun. And then they'll output on the uh, carrier. So if I have a carrier that looks like this, and usually the carrier is a lot more complicated than that because they've got more planet gears, uh, but they'll output on the uh, carrier. Okay. It's a fairly uh, common arrangement. And I had some nice pictures of this. I won't put them up. I don't want to get into a copyright issue. But you go down and you get a, a brochure from the John Deere dealer or go somewhere else if you like a different color or something. And they're probably going to really brag <coughs> on this. Uh, final drives, you can spend a lot of money if you have a, a machine that has weak final drives in it fixing it. Uh, so that, that's a real selling point for, for equipment. Now, some, some of the manufacturers, John Deere included, but uh, not just uh, them, uh, other manufacturers, they have gone to kind of an interesting arrangement where they'll have a tracked vehicle. And they do it this with a, a large wheel in the back. Then they have sometimes a smaller wheel up front. They have the uh, carrier, little carrier wheels like this. And uh, end up with uh, something like this. Okay, and if we look at uh, what's going on here, it's kind of interesting. Um, it's a little more complicated because with uh, steering this arrangement, they just turn the uh, the front wheels here, or steering this, they have a big hinge in the middle and will arc articulate the entire vehicle. Steering here, they actually uh, do it a little more like steering a bulldozer, although it has a steering wheel. It, uh, a little more complicated. I'll show you how they, they actually do that. They have a final drive arrangement like this. So again, you're going to have a, a sun gear, a couple of uh, planetary gears in there. Have those uh, hooked together like this. And this is fairly schematic. It's a lot heavier than that. A lot more planetaries in here. In there. And again, they uh, take the output on the carrier. output on the carrier and they will input on the sun consistent there and they will well, kind of fix the ring gear. What they do on the ring gear is they will uh, actually have it so it can rotate and they'll put a gear on it and they can rotate that either way. And what they'll do is they will have this gear essentially affixed um, through an idler to the other planetary. The other planetary, let's say the other planetary is, is over here. Like that. Okay. so that when this goes uh, when this rotates one direction this rotates the opposite direction and by rotating this one way or another they can change this ra ratio and they change this ratio in the opposite direction so if this is the um, and according to the picture here, the uh, uh, far side track, or if we look at uh, that would be driver's side or the uh, left side, and we call this the uh, right side. As this one slows down, that one speeds up, and you're going to be able to get a, a turning effect out of this. Likewise, if this goes the other direction, this is going to go, uh, if, 
if we said um, this slows down and that speeds up, if you go the other direction, then this one slows down and this one speeds up. So it's really interesting. They don't necessarily fix this one in a traditional sense. It's hooked to another gear train, and there's a hydraulic motor that runs this shaft. And when you turn the steering wheel up here, we'll put the steering wheel on the cat, you're actually controlling that hydraulic motor. That's how they get the very smooth steering out of that. So it's kind of interesting. The other thing about this is they tend not to want to uh, uh, move the tracks in and out. So usually you'll see a great big planetary final drive there, which just means when they take this output, the carrier goes out, it bec goes into a, another, uh, another uh, sun gear. I have a couple more planet gears here, and it starts all over again. So they have multiple final drives here. It drives from one planetary that's uh, facilitating the steering to another planetary that's located uh, clear outboard on the axle. The reason for this is in all of these cases, you want to try and transmit your torque at the highest uh, velocity possible so that you can have the minimum amount of torque, because as your uh, omega it goes down, your torque is going to have to increase to get a certain amount of horsepower. So what we want to do is we want to transfer, uh, if we have low omega and uh, high torque, the shafts have to be really large, right? Okay, whereas if we have a, an arrangement where we have a high omega, real high speed, the torque to transmit the same amount of power is going to be nice and small, and we can get away with a much smaller shaft much smaller components. So we try and transfer all of this power and then at the very last moment we run it through these final drives and dramatically uh, reduce the speed and increase uh, the, the torque. So that's the, uh, the game they're looking at. So you probably know, hopefully know, more about planetary gear systems, how to analyze them. It's pretty straightforward to analyze them. I remember a question on the uh, professional engineer's test uh, was uh, through a lot of people for uh, difficulty. It's a planetary set, but if you remember these concepts, it was a very easy problem. And you'll, you'll see a lot of these. So uh, grab yourself a, a tractor brochure. Check out some of this. If you're uh, mechanically inclined, this will be uh, very interesting. Well, we're going to go on to the uh, next section, which is a uh, somewhat of a departure from this, and start to look at uh, multi-link mechanisms and things like that. So let's say that someone came along and we had some sort of a flywheel or a wheel like this, and it's uh, fixed here, and it's uh, rotating. We could say that it had some omega and had some alpha. And then we might say at uh, some point over here we would have this uh, connecting rod that would go up and connect it to a, a piston. That piston might then be constrained in some sort of a track or a bore or something like that. Maybe I'll give these some letters. We'll say we have A and we have O and we'll say that that's B. And the question might come up is if it's rotating like this maybe we wonder what's what's the velocity here? What's the acceleration here? <coughs> and you might say well I'm not even sure that's the right direction. Okay, And that's okay. Because what we're going to do is we're going to go back to our relative uh, velocity, our relative acceleration. And we're going to look at our old friends where maybe the velocity of B, we could say, was the velocity of A plus the velocity of B with respect to A. Is that true? Let's see. The velocity of B would be equal to the velocity of A, if we can talk about the velocity of A. And then we imagine a someone at B and us standing at A observing the uh, person at B. That would be the velocity of B with respect to A. Indeed, that's the velocity of B. We could uh, differentiate this, of course, and get the acceleration of B is equal to the acceleration of A plus the acceleration of B with respect to A. So we'll use those. We could uh, use omega and alpha to get uh, what's going on here at A. That would be the first term. And then we could uh, talk about what's going on. There's probably some angular velocity and uh, angular acceleration in this length. We could talk about the second term. That is the velocity of this point B 
to an observer at A or the acceleration of B to an observer at A. Now, this is probably going to get more tedious and more difficult than it might look because if I start to look at what's the acceleration of A, this could have a normal and tangential component. The acceleration of B with respect to A could have a normal and tangential component. So these problems are always going to revert back to the same equations, but sometimes it's going to be a little bit tedious before we uh, get done. So that's where we're going to go in the uh, the next lecture. We'll get to uh, uh, practice uh, with that, and uh, uh, that should be uh, fun and uh, show us some, some more interesting problems that we can look at. Well, thank you for watching. Take care till then, and I'll talk to you soon.